Hello there, everyone. So today we are back finishing our journey in the Cold War. We have two more videos to go here, getting to the end of the Cold War and how it all finally went down with ultimately the fall of the Soviet Union. So let's get into it here. One thing I want to start with is it is important to understand that not everybody simply accepted Soviet dominance, particularly in Eastern Europe. There were revolts and underground resistance that did occur um, in which people fought against the Soviets. The earliest example of that was in 1956 when the Hungarians just straight revolt um, against what was going on. Um, and they'll have a little bit of success, unfortunately. The Soviets will come in and crush it because in 1956 they're just too powerful and nobody's coming in to help the, the Hungarians at that time. They thought the U.S. might help, but we were not coming in. But there would be other resistance and people wanting to break. Probably the biggest one after that comes in 1968 with the Prague Spring led by Alexander Ducek in Czechoslovakia. And what you had in the Prague Spring was a revolt by the people of Czechoslovakia calling for things like greater individual freedoms, um, the partial decentralization of the economy. They're basically trying to get rid of communism, um, individual rights for media. They want to be able to travel more. Again, the, the with the Iron Curtain, everything's on block. Um, and the Soviets, of course, do not like that. And so they're going to invade, but this will go a little bit differently. In Hungary, in Hungary, it was really hit and ended pretty quickly. In this case, the Czechs will hold out for eight months in trying to prevent the Russians from taking out the revolution. Um, unfortunately, that would not be successful. However, one young man, Jan Palak, in order to draw attention to what the Soviets were doing, um, actually sets himself on fire. Um, so that to gain greater media coverage, again, hoping to get the support of the outside world. Um, it doesn't necessarily go the way that he wants to, but it really, you know, you can tell the desperation that the, the people in many of these Eastern Bloc countries were having that this young man was willing to kill himself to try to show what was going on. Um, here is a picture, a couple pictures of the Hungarian revolution. I mean, even at one point they knocked down and cut the head off a statue of Stalin. So, you know, Stalin didn't like that. 1968, here's the Prague Spring. And on the right, there's Alexander Ducek. The next picture, it's in black and white. But for some people, if you want to kind of skip ahead a little bit, um, we have Jan Palak. Here's Jan Palak on the, on the left. And of course, that was the moment shortly after he had set himself on fire. It's just absolutely terrible. But we see what people were willing to do. And they would encourage others and inspire others. And then another big movement starts in 1979 into 1980, which is the creation of a organization known as Solidarity in Poland. So Solidarity was a trade union in Poland who initially their goals is to help workers um, who worked in some pretty infamous and terrible conditions. They actually do get recognized. They're the first independent union recognized in the Eastern Bloc. You had over 10 million members, tremendously huge part of their population, and they would be led by a man by the name of Lech Walesa. I think I said Walesa. I think it's Walesa. You can look it up. But what starts to happen is they gain more and more members. They realize that they're in the position to fight for social reform. And ultimately, that social reform was getting rid of the Soviets, having democratic elections, having a free nation. Not surprisingly, that then later gets them banned. Um, however, they still continue to fight underground. Actually, in 1983, Lech Walesa is given the Nobel Peace Prize. And they really start to gain help from the outside. I mean, the U.S. talked about them a lot and also sent them aid. But more importantly, they got a huge boost, which really helped keep the people of Poland focused from the Pope at the time. Uh, pope John Paul II, you see him there on the bottom right, uh, was Polish. He was actually the first non-Italian pope in like 500 years when he was elevated in the 1970s. 
And he was a very vocal supporter of solidarity and the people of Poland, particularly because the communists were very much anti-religion. And Poland itself is a devoutly Catholic nation. I mean, I'm sure it's well over 90% of the population is Catholic there. It is really ingrained in so many of their cultural and even political um, customs. And to have that support really kept people focused. And they would push and push. And Poland is one of the first countries eventually to break free from the Soviet Union. Uh, they will create a democratic government. And Lech Walesa will actually become the first president. And so it's important to understand that there was always this undercurrent of people that were ready to get out and people that would be, you just needed to get more momentum. You need to get a little bit more support for the mass amount of people to actually try to rise up, which is really what you needed. Hungarian revolution, Prague Spring, they just didn't have enough people. But what you see with like solidarity, you do have enough people. The other thing that's not going so good for the Soviets is their economy. The fact of the matter is, is that there's no growth. And that's one of the downfalls to a communist system of economics. It can't grow. It can't adjust to changing economies over time. Um, they had a severe lack of trade. Um, they were struggling with jobs. Uh, the agricultural sector, sector starts to go in the 70s and 80s as well. And things aren't so good. So you have this little undercurrent of resistance from the people of Eastern Europe. You have these economic problems. And now we have to see, so how is the U.S. going to play in all of this? So initially what the U.S. starting in the 1970s is going to do is actually scale it back a little bit. And we have the period of the, the detente or the detente, mainly led by Richard Nixon. And so what Nixon was trying to do with both Russia and China was normalize relations a little bit and try to get us not necessarily to cooperate and not be like best friends and hug it out on the weekends and stuff, but more have a cordial existence with one another. He scored his biggest victories with Russia. Uh, he actually becomes the first president to ever visit Russia, where he will lead, uh, meet with the general secretary of Russia, and that's the leader being, at that time, Leonid Brezhnev. And there's a picture of them at the top, you know, yucking it up there. But more importantly, they take a big, big step with the creation of the SALT Treaty, which will become known also as the SALT-1 Treaty, because there's a SALT-2 Treaty later on. And what the SALT Treaty is going to do is address really the biggest elephant in the room, which is nuclear weapons. And what this did, it didn't reduce the amount of nuclear weapons, but both nations agreed to put a cap on the nuclear weapons of the nukes that we have. That's all we're doing. We're not going to expand it. And secondly, it also made each side limit the amount of anti-ballistic missile sites they had, which is very, very good because if you don't have anti-ballistic missile sites, then you can't shoot missiles down that are coming in, which also makes you less likely to shoot yours out. And this was huge. I mean, it had been you know, really decades since you had this type of, of cooperation between the United States and Russia. And it's like, okay, we're turning a corner. Nixon then also visits China, first sitting president to do that. And there you see a picture on the bottom of him meeting with Mao, who was kind of fading out of power at that time. But what Nixon does there is actually has the United States finally formally recognize communist China as China and will be part of China becoming a full member of the United Nations. Huge deal. Huge, huge deal in calming these things down. Last time I talked about the U.S. and China, we were fighting each other and in the Korean War, and MacArthur was going to nuke them. And so that's a big, big deal. And you see Nixon doing all of these things to calm it down. And because I just showed a lot of pictures of Nixon, we got to show the picture of Nixon and Elvis, right? I mean... Elvis. It's cool. All right. But in the late 1970s, it's just going to go bad again. Um, we talked about this a little bit before in, in my classes, but in the late 1970s, you start to see the tension ramp up. Um, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. We do not take that lightly. We do not want them expanding power, so we're going to help resist them there, as I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, with Jimmy Carter, you know, Carter boycotts the 1980 Olympics and the Russians will boycott 1984. But a lot of this has to do with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan really, when he was running for uh, president in 1980, he made 
really you know aggressiveness toward the Russians and what they were doing in light of like Afghanistan part of his platform. And when he got into office, it was about the Russians are the bad guys and we need to resist them. We're going to massively increase our economy, or, or not our economy. We do, actually, but we increase our military. Um, there's actually a communist revolution in Grenada, which is a small, or Grenada, a small island country in the Caribbean. But we send the military down there to crush that. And he then, in the mid 1980s, makes a huge speech speech and some pretty big proclamations um, while speaking in Berlin. So let, let's give a listen. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that's really just Reagan just throwing down the gauntlet there. And it was absolutely huge. And as I said, we're going to be really aggressive. We're going to send massive amounts of military aid to fight um, against the, to help the fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Um, in previous video, I also talked about our support of the Contras in Nicaragua to fight communism there. Reagan will go to some summits with the Russians as well, but I want to focus on the early summits because that's when it's really, really tense. Um, he will meet with the premier of Russia at that time, Mikhail Gorbachev, who I'll talk more in my second video, and it's really rough. And one of the reasons why it's rough is the United States under Reagan basically proclaims that we are developing something called the Strategic Defense Initiative. And the idea is this was going to be a program that will completely eliminate the Russian nuclear threat, that we were going to have this web of defensive forces that could knock down any missile that the Russians would launch at any time, rendering them impotent. So let's look at what it looked like. The truth of the matter is, is that we didn't have this. Okay, there were some TV shows about it, and there were some of these things here. Um, the press in the United States made fun of it. They called it Star Wars, uh, because you see here, it's like we were going to have this laser, and then we were going to bounce it off one mirror, and then bounce it off a fighting mirror. Not even kidding, it's called a fighting mirror. And then, boom, that would tag these missiles. And we had space-based lasers and like all this stuff. Not even remotely close to it. But when the Russians would come to the table to try to deal with us, they're like, look, you have to get rid of the SDI or, or we're not going to deal. And we're like, no way, we're not getting rid of the SDI. We had no SDI. Actually, a renowned physicist Stephen Hawking spoke out against it. He was like, there's no way the U.S. can do this. It's like, this is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. What are you talking about? Didn't matter. Reagan sold it so hard that the Russians had to completely rethink what they were doing and really were kind of off guard on, on like, how do we deal with this U.S. thing here? And so as the 80s are going on, you can see like 1984, 85, 86, like Russia is really on the precipice here. They're struggling in Afghanistan. Their economy's tanking. The U.S. economy's going through the roof. We're doing all this military stuff. And it really at this point seems like it's just a matter of time before the whole thing falls apart. All right, guys, hopefully that gave you a good idea what was going on. And our next video, we'll finish it up. See you soon.